Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Murder in the Mission by Angus McLean A century ago, the murder of a family in the old Mission San Miguel Archangel was a very popular topic of conversation, and it was said that bloodstains could be seen on the walls and floors for many years after the crime. This was blood which had spurted from the trembling bodies of the victims, who had been attacked while slumbering and had literally been chopped to death with an axe. To add substance to this legend, even then in the making the spectral forms of the unholy quintet who had perpetrated this atrocious crime were scaring unwary wayfarers who chanced to be passing the gloomy mission buildings on a moonlit night. The story behind this legend of murder and ghosts has come down through the years in many versions, including various spellings of the family's name. What was the true story? In his History of San Luis Obispo County, published in 1883, Myron Angel tells us that a Mr. Reed, an Englishman, gained possession of the old San Miguel Mission buildings some time before 1847 and established his family there, having brought them up from South America. With the discovery of gold in 1848, Reed took off for the Sierras to mine, returning that fall with several thousand dollars' worth of gold dust. He was hospitable and loquacious and took pleasure in exhibiting his wealth. In October of that year, a party of sailors, deserters from a ship of war, lying in the harbor of Monterey, stopped for the night in the mission, eating supper with the Reed family. Then sometime during that night, the whole family, including the young children of the household, was slaughtered. A day after the murders had been committed, John M. Price and Francis Z. Branch, themselves returning from the mine's country, stopped at the mission. They had known Reed, and they were worried when no one made an appearance, so they searched the buildings until they came upon the bodies. Then they went to San Luis Obispo to report the crime. A posse formed and pursued the murderers, overtaking them at Carpinteria near Santa Barbara. In the ensuing fight, one of the posse was killed and others were wounded. The murderers themselves were all killed. One of them jumped into the ocean and tried to swim away, but was shot before he could get out of rifle range and sank to rise no more. According to Mr. Angel, the Reed family consisted of Reed himself, his pregnant wife, his daughter, his son-in-law, three children, and an old retainer all murdered that faithful night, eight persons killed in all. Here we have an account written by a reputable historian some thirty years after the incident took place. Mr. Angel gave credit to one of the men who had discovered the crime, John M. Price, for the details as given in the book and that is the true story of the murder in the mission. Or is it? In San Luis Obispo and Environs, an updated version of local history compiled by Annie Morrison and published in 1917, there is an account of the murder of the Reed family in the old mission San Miguel, apparently based on the Angel account, for it follows that version fairly closely. The victims are identified as Mr. Reed, his wife and infant daughter, Reed's daughter and son-in-law, there are three children, a woman who had come to act as midwife, and the old retainer, all killed by a band of renegade sailors who had stopped at the mission for supper. In this version, the eight persons murdered in Angel's story have increased to ten with the addition of the midwife and the baby. History of San Luis Obispo County, edited by A. V. Kell, published in 1939, says that in December of 1848, there came to the mission San Miguel five sailors who had deserted from a man of war in Monterey. In this account, Reed showed the sailors a bag of gold obtained from a sale of sheep to the miners. The sailors went on to Paso Robles, but returned the following night and murdered Reed and his family. Here, the persons murdered are listed as Reed himself, his wife and infant son, his brother-in-law named as Jose Ramon Vallejo, 
Josefa Oliveira, the midwife, her daughter and son, the latter who was four years old, and three servants, including a five-year-old Indian boy. This is a sharply different arrangement of characters from that given in Angel's book, Ten Persons Killed Counting the Baby. In the Angel book, the wife was near confinement. The editor of this book admits there are various versions of this incident, one version holding that midwife Oliveira escaped the massacre, and another version saying that it was the Indian boy who escaped. In California Missions by J. Berger, published in 1941, the story is the San Miguel Mission was sold to Petronillo Rios and William Reed in 1846 by then Governor Pio Pico. This account goes on to say that in 1848, a party of five adventurers murdered the Reed family, ten persons who were at the time occupying the Padres' quarters in the old mission building. And it goes on. The five murderers were tracked down. One was shot, one drowned, and three were executed following capture. In the Salinas by Ann B. Fisher, 1945, there's still a different account of the incident. Mrs. Fisher got her material from interviews with old-time residents of the Salinas Valley. According to this version, Petronillo Rios and William Reed, an English sailor, bought the mission San Miguel from Governor Pio Pico for $300. Then Gold was discovered, and Reed and Rios left. After their return, three renegades Reed had met in the gold fields came by. Reed bragged too much, and the renegades massacred the whole family. In this telling of the story, the persons killed were William Reed, his expectant Indian wife, her eight-year-old brother, an aging midwife, her daughter, this daughter's child, and two little boys who were sons of Reed. Also killed were as a servant, an aging sheep herder and a sheep herder's young grandson. Here we have 11 persons killed, and a sharply different arrangement of characters. Of these, one little boy escaped the slaughter, wandered into the mustard fields, and died from exposure. In this account, the renegade number three, and when overtaken by the posse near Santa Barbara, two were shot, and the Irishman surrendered, but was shot soon afterward. The man who discovered the bodies is identified as Captain Price, of Los Osos Rancho. Missions of California, compiled for B, G, and E Company in 1970, contains still another version of the story. This account says that Petronillo Rios and William Reed bought the San Miguel Mission from Governor Pico in 1846, paying $600 for the property. In 1848, Reed went to the gold fields, brought back some gold dust, and also sold some cattle and sheep. Then, in December, 1848, five deserters from a British man of war had dinner with the Reeds and learned of Reed's good fortune. They left, but slipped back at night and murdered Reed, his family, servants, and visitors. Eleven persons were killed, but no names are given in this account. A posse pursued the murderers and intercepted them near Santa Barbara. One killer was shot, another jumped into the ocean and drowned, and three were hanged. For years there were legends of ghosts prowling the ruins of the mission. The story is handed down by the descendants of Petronillo Rios names the murder victims as William Reed, his wife, their three-year-old child, Mrs. Reed's young brother, an older woman acting as nurse or midwife, her married daughter, this daughter's young child, a servant, and a sheepman and his grandson. Some versions say that this sheepman was a Basque or Portuguese who chanced to be traveling through with his grandson and took lodging for the night, while another version says he was an Indian sheep herder working for Reed. Another version of the story is handed down through the years, has an Indian family as the victim slaughtered, and the old mission possibly confusing this incident with some other from those lawless years. There have been many accounts of this murder in the old mission San Miguel, in books and in magazines, and newspaper articles printed through the years, as well as the recollections of descendants of early residents of the area. Details vary. The name of the murdered family has been given variously as Reed, 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 and Reed, all spelled differently. The number of persons slaughtered ranges from 7 to 15, and the bloody villains from 3 to 7, with 5 the number most often accepted. The persons comprising the Reed household vary sharply in the telling, both as to their numbers and their relationship to the head of the household. Some versions say that Senora Oliveira, the midwife, was William Reed's mother-in-law, and that there were members of her family in the massacre. 
The murderous malefactors have been identified as British sailors from a man of war they had deserted. American sailors or soldiers who had deserted and mongrel renegades who had followed Reed from the gold fields for his poke of gold. Some versions go into gory detail and tell how the older members of the household were chopped to death with an axe while he slept, and how the younger children were grabbed by their feet and their brains bashed out against the pillars and walls of the old mission. Should this tale from the long ago be discounted as but a bit of folklore, an incident which probably never took place at all, simply because of the erratic reporting of it? No one has ever questioned the basic story of the slaughter of a family within the walls of the old San Miguel mission building by a pack of renegades whose motive was presumably robbery. However, it would appear that either those assigned the grisly task of removing the victims' bodies from the buildings and burying them failed to write down an official account identifying the bodies, or, if such an official record was made, it hasn't been misplaced or lost. It is hard for modern researchers who have grown accustomed to the fine reference libraries, the stacks of newspapers, magazines, etc., and the detailed but tedious courthouse records from which to sift their information, to realize just how meager were records of any sort under frontier conditions. Most cases, those trying to reconstruct the frontier past must rely on accounts written sometimes as much as 30 to 50 years after the incidents took place, accounts which, when set down, relied less on written records than on survivors' memories, memories already growing hazy with the passing of the years. Under such conditions, details were bound to get scrambled, but that does not mean the incident did not take place. Heck, I sidetracked from the theme I started on, namely the ghosts of those murderers who used to haunt the old mission grounds a century ago. Whatever happened to them? Wayfarers speeding past the old mission San Miguel and their high-powered cars don't have time for ghosts. Sar spectral friends have in recent years been woefully neglected. However, unless the old boy down below has relented and taken their guilt-harried souls home to hell, they're probably around somewhere, will again make their appearance on moonlit nights when folks slow down enough to see them. And now, having learned what happens to the immortal souls of unregenerate evildoers, let us look at what happened to the mortal bodies of some of the murdersome miscreants in those robust years, now long gone and almost forgotten. To start with the grisly tale of an insignificant man who rides the tail of a comet. An insignificant man rides the tail of a comet. He does but ride the tail of a comet. An insignificant man who seeks importance by claiming an association with a more illustrious man. Hugo the bartender spat a quatch of tobacco juice into the nearest spittoon, wiped his walrus mustachio with a soiled dish towel he held in his hand, then went back to wiping dry the drinking glass on the bar in front of him. He claims to have been a trusted lieutenant of Joaquin. Bah! Hugo spat again, wiped his mustachio, and went on. Joaquin Murieta would have wiped his backside on such as he, then would have thrown him away as unworthy of being used for a second wipe. The man had me fooled, the gringo newcomer acknowledged. He was the most convincing raconteur, especially about his own daring exploits. Then the gringo laughed. True or false, his tales of daring do were worth a bottle of tequila. Abdullo Tigre, he called himself, when first he came into the Santa Maria Valley about ten years ago. One of the barroom loungers entered the conversation. His claim then was that he had been one of Joaquin Murieta's band of insurrectos, and since the estimable Joaquin had by then departed Alta California and was not around to deny the claim, there were many who believed him. Abdulo el Tigre, another bar lounger exclaimed, then laughed, as though el Tigre were funny. He has proven to be a most uninspiring tiger. Abdulo el Asno is what everyone calls him now. Abdulo? The American's tone implied a question. That name sounds more Turk than Spanish or Indian. Abdulo Sai was a Saracen sailor who jumped ship in old Yucatan, and his dam was a barmaid of our people, Hugo explained. At least, that is Abdullo's story, and it is probably true. It is probably the only truth in all his cuentos fantástico. The bar lounger, who had spoken first, laughed and went on. His cuentos de hadas, fairy tales, do keep him in liquor, and when hungry enough, he can always find work enough for a meal. Though, of a truth, he would rather starve to death than to hunt for a worthwhile job. Hunched down in his chair, 
At a table in a corner, Abdullo drank his tequila alone, for no one had seen fit to join him when he offered to share the bottle which the American had ordered placed on his table. If he did overhear the conversation at the bar, through the jovial din of the barroom, he gave no sign. On his swarthy, hawk-nosed face, there was reflected all the deep-rooted resentment that the outcast feel towards all mankind. True, Abdullo had no one to blame but himself. When he first came into the Santa Maria Valley, he had been received in a comradely manner, had always been invited to join the celebrants in the local cantinas, and his rather grandiose accounts of his own exploits may even have been given some credence by his new acquaintances. Abdullo had been endowed by nature with a superb animal body which seemed to stand up remarkably well under his indolent, dissolute way of life. Also he had a shrewd mind, capable of devising clever ruses and a glib tongue, which usually got him out of difficult situations. In short, Abdullo Tigre was a man whose every appearance would seem to fit in with his self-assured role of un bandido bravo. Four flushers, however, cannot fool their audiences forever, and men who must work for a living in time grow tired of buying dinners and drinks for a man who rarely works. In time, Abdullo's plaint that work was scarce fell on deaf ears. Other men found work, so why not Abdullo? And now, with the big war between the states drawing working men into the army, Abdullo's whining plaint that work was scarce was even less valid than it had been in the past. Throughout the years since coming into the Santa Maria Valley, Abdullo had been arrested for petty offenses on several occasions, and one of those times he had served six months on the chain gang. His reputation as a near-do-well had spread from Santa Maria to other communities, and with the passing of time, Abdullo became a suspect in even more serious crimes, though as yet nothing serious had been proven against him. He was like a sheep-killer dog, who may already have acquired a taste for blood. So said men who knew sheeps, dog, and men. These derelictions of Abdullo, hijo del Saraceno, were recounted for the Americanos' benefit by the men at the bar. Quite indifferent that Abdullo himself was in the bar room within hearing distance, if indeed he could comprehend what was said in his present state of intoxication. A great man blazes his own pathway across the heavens, a comet in his own right. Hugo the bartender was in a philosophical mood. On the other hand, an insignificant man, instead of emblazoning his own brilliance through noteworthy deeds, rides the tail of a comet. Sick to the stomach, yet impelled by morbid curiosity, the Americano watched the gruesome proceedings. His four American companions also watched, but having been raised on the frontier, they had acquired some degree of callousness. Nonetheless, even these hardened frontiersmen found it somewhat revolting to watch without protest as men skinned the still twitching carcass of another man. This time, at least, the impromptu execution of an evildoer had not been because of high-handed gringo prejudice against the native Californios. To their credit, the five Americans in the party which had tracked down the murderer had done their level best to convince their Sonoran fellow avengers that the captive miscreant should be taken back to Santa Maria and there given a legal trial, but to no avail for the Americans were outnumbered seventeen to five by the Sonoreños. The victim of the crime had been a Sonoran, an elderly man, a kindly inoffensive man well liked in the community, and his death had come through no fault of his own, no fault that is save only that he had worked hard and had been frugal. It had been rumored around Santa Maria that the old man had a small hoard of gold hidden in his isolated cabin, gold coins saved from his productive years towards the needs of advancing age. The old Sonoreño had been brutally beaten, his arm broken, and then left for dead. However, there had still been enough life left in his broken body when he was found for him to name his assailant before he died, and the name that the dying man had given was Abdullo, el hijo del Saraceno. To the Sonorans living around Santa Maria, this had been a crime against one of their own people, and the hot blood of old Spain, mingled with that of the prideful Yaqui, demanded vengeance immediate vengeance. It had been they who had organized the band to track down the killer, and it had been with some reluctance that they had allowed any of the Americanos to accompany them as they left on their mission of vengeance. The guilt of the wretched Abdullo could hardly be questioned, for the old man had named him before he died, and others had seen him in the general vicinity of the cabin shortly before the crime had been committed. Then to add to this initial evidence against Abdullo, the tracks of a shod horse had been located back of the old Sonoran's cabin, and those tracks 
had led directly to a hastily made camp in the Swasna country, and in that camp taken by surprise was none other than Abdullo, son of a Saracen. Even more damning, personal items known to belong to the old man, along with several hundred dollars in gold coins, gold coins which Abdullo most certainly had not come by through legitimate channels, were found on Abdullo's person. On the strength of such overwhelming evidence of guilt, and for such a heinous crime there was not a court of law in the land that would not have convicted Abdullah and given him the death sentence. Abdullah the misfit richly deserved hanging and aware that it would be useless to further insist that the murderer be taken back to town for an official trial of five Americans that agreed to be a vigilante-type trial on the spot. Then with the trial over, the Americans had agreed to an immediate execution of the condemned man. Here again a conflict of wills had taken place. The Americans had insisted that Abdullah be hanged, the official form of execution. The Sonorans, however, wanted a slower, more painful form of death, more in keeping with their own Yaqui heritage. The Americans had prevailed to the extent that the condemned man had been given a degree of hanging. However, the Sonoreños had insisted on performing that ceremony by themselves, not entrusting it to the gringos. The Sonorans first stripped Abdullah stark naked, then put one loop of a reata around his thick bull neck and the other end of the rope across a limb, then pulled the groveling wretch up till his toes barely touched the ground, and held his arms to prevent his easing the choking effect of the tightened noose. When strangled into a state of near unconsciousness, Abdullah had been released from the noose and laid out on the ground. Then, although the man obviously was not yet dead, the Sonoran started skinning him. A skinning knife had been inserted near the navel, then run completely around the body, severing the skin into two separate portions, with one team of skinners peeling the hide of the torso upward, like a sweatshirt being removed. Meanwhile, the other team of skinners were peeling their portions downward, much as though they were removing a pair of trousers. At this point, Abdullah regained consciousness, left forth a shriek, and almost jerked away from his captors, but was restrained. The American newcomer protested, but received a curt, Calla se la boca, gringo. A viejo did not receive a speedy death at the hands of this mad dog. So why should the dog receive a speedy death at our hands? You had better keep your lip button, friend, one of the Americans warned Soto Vose. As you can see, our paisano pals can play rough when they are riled. The shriek subsided to a gurgling intake of breath as shock brought unconsciousness, and in time the skinners had the skin of the upper torso peeled up to the neck where it was severed along the line of the chin, then pulled across the head, then the arms peeled down, severing the skin at the wrist, leaving an inside-out hide resembling a long-sleeved sweater or undershirt. Meanwhile, the other team had peeled the skin of the lower body downward, stripping the skin across the thighs and calves without slitting it, then severed it at the ankles, leaving the body completely skinned except for the head, hands, and feet. There was still a jerking of the limbs and a gurgling sound in the throat, but the, whether this was from any awareness of pain or merely the reflex actions of a body still pliant, the American newcomer could not tell. Grimly, the American thought back to that evening when he had first met Abdullah and had listened half-believing to his dramatic tales of his adventures as a member of Joaquin Murieta's band of insurrectos. What was it that Hugo the bartender had said? Instead of emblazoning his own brilliance through noteworthy deeds, the insignificant man writes the tale of a comet. Joaquin Murieta had been the comet, his deeds of daring already becoming a legend. Abdullah had been the trail rider. His only brilliance what little reflected glory he could get through claiming to have once been part of Murieta's band. But there all resemblance ceased. There had been something of gallantry about Joaquin, something to inspire the respect of other men in spite of his outlaw status. But there had been no redeeming qualities in Abdullah the outcast. In life he had been an insignificant man, relying on unreflected glory. In death he suffered the degradation of being skinned like an animal. There was none to grieve the passing of Abdullah, hijo del Saraceno, no, not one. In death, Abdullah, son of a Saracen, was to achieve a fame he had not known in life, but alas, it was not the memory of daring deeds that brought him fame. Rather, it was his durable hide that would for a time be a reminder of his sorry, misspent life. It has been said that the Skinners took the hide of Abdullah home with them, and they put it on stretchers, much the way a trapper does the hide of a varmint, to keep its shape while that hide is being cured. The tubular hide, having been turned inside out while on the stretchers, was thus processed without having to be split open. Stretched, cured, and properly tanned, the hide of Abdullah resembled a buckskin undershirt and drawers, and by making a slit at the throat, ankles, and wrist, 
to allow head, feet, and hands to pass through these restricted areas, and a human hide, the leathered garments, could be donned by living men. Fortunately, Abdullah had been a large barrel-chested man, and the stretching the hide achieved an even greater circumference than it had while on its original owner. A small man could don these garments of human hide over winter-weight red flannels. A medium-sized man could wear them over a summer-weight union suit, but a big man had to strip right down to his own bare hide before he could wiggle his frame into these weird garments made from human hide and seamless. However, once inside, the wearer found the garment skin type but shaped properly to the contours of his own body. At least, that is the way certain old-timers should describe the buckskin shirt and drawers made from human hide. Footnote. Back in the 1920s, an old Sonoran who had lived much of his life in the Santa Maria area told, as an incident from his own youth, this tale of the son of a Saracen, who had paid for his slaying of an aged Sonoran by being hanged and then skinned. He spoke as though his own stepfather had been among the band of avengers, and he told of the unique garments made from that hide. Like tying a knot in the old devil's tail. Glumly the sheriff of Monterey County indicated to his men that they might as well make camp for the night. There was grass aplenty for the horses in the meadow below the spring and water for both horses and men, and Gilroy, the nearest town, was still a good twenty-five miles away. Grumbling disgustedly that while their horses would have plenty to eat and drink, they themselves would have to make out on hard tack biscuits and dried jerky, the men of the posse unsaddled their horses and hobbled them before turning them loose in the meadow below the spring chosen as an overnight camp. There was considerable muttering that if they had not wasted so much blankety-blank time swinging round by that blankety-blank new Adira mines, they would have made it into Gilroy in plenty of time for a restaurant-cooked supper. Quit your damn belly aching, the sheriff snapped. If you local yahoos had reached the town, you'd have swizzled so much damn swill, you wouldn't be worth your salt tomorrow. The sheriff wasn't in a particularly happy mood. When he had organized this posse three days back, he had such high hopes of bringing the brigand Vasquez back to Monterey with him. But everything had gone sour. Three days of going around and combing the cabby lands in the Diablo Mountains, and what did he have besides a pack of saddle-weary galoots grumbling about having been dragged out into nowhere on a crazy wild goose chase? Three days of scouting out every possible place a band of men on the dodge might logically use as a hideout, and still nary a sign of Vasquez and his coyote pack anywhere. It all started back ten days ago when a posse of lawmen from Kern County, following a raid on one of their own scattered settlements, had chased the Vasquez Kang up into the Chichapi Mountains, and there lost their trail. So in disgust over losing their quarry, the Kern County posse turned back and returned home. Logically, it seemed the gang would make their way southward towards Ventura or Los Angeles, split up and find a hiding place there among the Paisano population, lie low until the pursuit died down, and then go back to their annoying raids once more. Then our friend, the sheriff of Monterey, had gotten what seemed at the time a very hot head. From someone he considered a reliable underground source had come word that the wily Vasquez had once again pulled a daring maneuver. He had not done the logical thing seeking refuge in the south line. Instead, he had doubled back with his men and even now was hiding in his old stomping grounds in the rugged La Cañada de Cantua and the Diablo Mountains of Central California. To head the posse which at long last captured the notorious bandit chief, truly that would be a brilliant feather in the cap of any aspiring lawman. Quietly, the sheriff of Monterey made his plans, first gathering his most trusted deputies without giving the public any advance notice of his intentions. Then before dawn, the sheriff and his men started out from Monterey for a trip into the rugged Cantua country, which was under the jurisdiction of Monterey County at the time of our story, although in later years it became the southeastern tip of San Benito County. They rode doggedly through the mountains for three days, but nowhere did the posse find hide, hoof, horn, nor hair of the wanted bandits. There was nary a sign that anyone had camped at any of the known springs nor any signs that horses had been tethered in any of the swales and meadows they had passed through. The posse had even swung round by the new Adira mines, hoping to gain some information there. The foremen of the new Adira mines had been most cooperative, maybe too cooperative. He had blandly assured the sheriff 
that he himself would question the men working at the mines to see if anyone had seen any suspicious characters hanging around the district. In fact, he had accompanied the sheriff as the latter made a tour of the mines, trying to question the paisanos working there. Nobody, would seem, had seen anyone in the least resembling Vasquez or any of his followers anywhere at all during recent weeks. The sheriff had expected the paisanos to have sympathy for Vasquez and his followers, but as to the foreman, something strange was going on. Just how did this new Adira Mines, of all the quicksilver mines in Central California, had suffered no robberies, even though it sat right there next to La Cañada de Cantua for so many years of favorite hangout of the outlaw bands? If that weren't proof enough, then top it off with that hold-up of the stage some months back, and reporting the hold-up the driver of the stage had said that when Vasquez first confronted the stage in order the passengers to debark, he had been his most insolent self. Then as the mines foreman and his lady stepped down from the stage, the bandit chief had seemed startled. Vasquez had tipped his hat and said that gallantry prevented his robbing a stage in which so lovely a lady was riding. Motioning his men to follow, the bandit chief had ridden away, the stage and the passengers alike unrobbed. Well, gallantry had never presented these Robin Hoods of the Gabilans from taking rings and brooches from lady passengers and other stages in the past. So what? It was all water under the bridge now. That lead, which at that time had seemed so reliable, had probably had its origin in cantina gossip, as had so many seemingly reliable leads in the past. The sheriff himself was an experienced tracker, and if anyone had camped in the Cantua country within recent weeks, he should have seen some signs of their presence. No doubt, Vasquez and his men had in fact gone south, as common sense would dictate. It was, but the luck of the game, grumbled our friends the sheriff of Monterey, as he and his men prepared their camp for the night. Come morning, the sheriff and his deputies rebrewed the stale dregs in the coffee pot, ate the last of their jerky and hardtack, then went to the meadow below their campsite to retrieve their hobbled horses. The horses were gone, and a bit of cross-tracking told the whole rice story. Taking advantage of the subdued light of a waning moon, someone had sneaked into the meadow in the wee small hours of the day, and these miscreants had loosened the hobbles and led the posse's horses away. Not a horse to be seen. Cussing fluently, the sheriff and his deputies set out on that twenty-five-mile hike to Gilroy, the nearest settlement, a most inglorious turn of events. There was no doubt in anyone's mind just who the perpetrators of this dastardly crime had been, though it had been a most foolhardy bit of bravado on part of the bandits. Had Vasquez and his men been in need of horses, they could have stolen horses of equal value elsewhere, and with a lot less risk. Obviously the stealing of the lawmen's horses had been a taunt directed at lawmen in general, like tying a knot in the old devil's tail. Having accompanied this feat, the knot tire would gain the plaudits of his admirers. But most certainly, such a knot tied in the devil's tail wasn't likely to improve the old boy's disposition at all. Footnote. The story of Vasquez and his merry men stealing the lawman's horses, leaving them to walk home, has come down through the years in various versions. It may well have had its base in some actual incident. 